one of the parents in the CF program came up to me and said, I remember you. You and Terry Gunville taught my CCD class in sixth grade. And it's true. I mean, we, we've been through a lot of that stuff as teenagers and young adults here in the parish. Terry went on to St. Francis Cemetery, Seminary. <laughs> for Iowa, Diocese of Iowa. Well then he decided that he was going to expand and he went into uh, counseling and I'm not exactly sure of the name of your degree but now he is an adolescent counselor for Waukesha County. He's a dad and a husband and so he's got a lot of stuff so let's welcome him. Well, it was 100 years ago, 75 years ago. Um, this, anybody a parishioner 25 years ago? You were? You were? Okay. This room was the church. And I, you know how when you're a kid, you always think things are bigger, you know, and then when you see them as an adult, then they just seem little. I walked in and I said, when did they put the whole new entrance in? Because this church was huge when I was a kid. I mean, it was huge. That's really not very big. Um, and you've done a wonderful job um, remodeling it because it didn't look this nice when it was a church. And it even had a spit sink. You know what a spit sink is? For athletics, you know, there's, there are two sinks. And you drink out of one, and then there's like a fountain in the other one. And yeah, it's in a church. Um, so um, let me, I, I, I said to my wife last night, it's a little bit weird going to St. James because, well, that 100 year thing. And, <laughs> and she said, well, but you're always nervous before you do stuff like this, so why are you even telling me this? Wives get impatient, at least my wife gets impatient with me. And um, so I said, well, I, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm, kind of nervous and she said well here I've got the perfect cure she said why don't you just say one of your crazy things and right in the beginning and then nobody will listen to you after that there's nothing to be nervous about well I couldn't come up with a crazy thing except driving over here God inspired me reminded me actually probably is more accurate that um, 20 some years ago I was teaching an adult Bible study here this is a true story, and you're not going to believe anything I say after this. You probably won't even listen, and you shouldn't. But, okay, so I was driving. I was a student at St. Francis Seminary. Seminary, where's Sue? Seminary, not cemetery. Um, and I was a busy graduate student and didn't always have time to prepare. And I have an obsession with preparing. I over-prepare. So I, one particular week, I didn't have a chance to over-prepare, so I probably was just prepared. And I was driving, well, I was speeding, truth be told. So driving out here, worried to death about not having been, or not feeling prepared. So, you know, I'm driving and I'm, I'm trying to talk to God like, God, you, you gotta help me out here. I mean, this is really serious. I, I'm really worried about it. And, I remember then thinking, okay, well, this can't go badly because really what we're talking about is God's word. And then I got an idea in my middle, probably late adolescent mind. I thought, well, okay, if this really is God's word that I'm talking about, if it goes badly, I mean, if it goes really badly, then God has to be the one that's embarrassed, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Not me. So, so I said, well, God, it's your name on the line here, buddy. You, you better come through. And as usual, God did. Um, thank God. Um, the other thing that I have to tell you before I really sort of start is that um, I have two little ones, which is a trip and a half. I have um, newfound respect for all of you parents. But um, they make bargains with me all the time. And so yesterday, while I was trying to put the last 
sort of last minute touches on my things, they wanted me to play Zingo, which seems sort of Catholic, right? You know, bingo, it's a kid's version of bingo. Okay, so, um, and I really wanted to play with them, but I also knew that I needed to put this together. So I, I said, well, okay, how about we do this? You give me a half an hour, and I can work on the computer for half an hour, and then I'll play Zingo with you. And so they wanted to know what I was preparing, and I said, well, we we're going to go out to St. James and Menominee Falls, and we've been to worship here on Sunday mornings, and so they know the place. And they said, well, my, my daughter, who has um, more spunk than I um, can even imagine, and I'm scared to death, she's exactly four going on 15. And I work with adolescents, so I, <laughs> God, I know what's coming. Um, <laughs> So she said, well, you can only do that tomorrow morning, like she would have any control over what I'm going to do. Um, you can only do that tomorrow morning if you tell John and Kate stories. Okay, so the John and Kate story, I teach um, at Ottawa University, and I have to start my classes out with John and Kate stories because they do such crazy things. So I have to tell one John story and one Kate story. So the Kate story is, um, this, she, um, we got um, a Leapster for them for Christmas. It's sort of a little computer thing. And um, they love it, but we only got one. Two children, one Leapster. Mm, somebody didn't think that one through. So, but they, they really, when we first got it, they shared very, very well. And so um, one day my wife watched them and she watched Kate, give it to John and say, here, John, I've had it for a long time now. You can have it. Well, okay, if, if you know Kate, that's like, that's miraculous. So Lynette called her up. She was sitting on the couch, and she sat on her lap, and she said, Kate, that was so kind. Your heart is so big. It's so filled with kindness. That's absolutely wonderful that you did this. Your heart has so much kindness in it. And she said, Mom. There isn't just kindness in my heart. There's also some sassy. <laughs> She's four. All right, the John story. Um, this goes back 100 years. When I, 100 years ago, I had a full head of hair. And um, it was very curly. You know, it was almost like in sort of an afro kind of a thing. I know you can't even imagine that. <laughs> and, and, and you think I'm lying. But so when my son had this beautiful head of curly hair, People would look at my wife, who's got straight hair, and me, who's got no hair, and they would say, well, is this the mailman, or what's the deal here? So then I would say, no, he's got my hair. I mean, you know, and then I have to go through this whole thing. Believe it or not, I, I really did have long, curly hair, and it, it was beautiful back then, and I, God took it or something. John took it. So when he was about two and a half, or maybe three, Lynette was gone, so it was just the three, ki the three of us, my two kids and I, were sitting at the dinner table, and John looked at me and got real serious and said, Dad, now I know I took your hair, so do you want some of it back? It would probably keep you warm. <laughs> All right, John and Kate stories. So um, here's what I would like you to do at your tables, and actually, is there paper at your tables? No. So there was some paper. I brought a whole stack. I know. Here it is. That's okay. Oh, there it is. Here, Sue, let me take some. All right, you can think about this while, I'm, while we're passing this out. Here's what I would like you to do. I would like you, and this will all make sense after we've done it and we talked about it a little bit. I want you to think of all of the advertising slogans that you can come up with as a, at, a, at your tables. So all of the advertising slogans. Now, here's proof that 100 years ago I was, uh, my brain was functioning more than it is now. Um, all I could think of were old slogans like, um, Coke, it's the real thing. Now, I think there's a new slogan for Coke, um, spread the love, or McDonald's, um, I'm loving it, or something about possibilities with Campbell's. Uh, what other ones can I think of? M&M's um, as, 
Um, find the M&M &M in you. Okay, now that's, I have a background in psychology. Find the M&M &M in you, and then you need to see me in private practice. So, go ahead, F talk about it, see how many slogans you can come up, and then somebody write them down for us. All right, so let's hear some of them. Just a few. Subway eat fresh. Subway eat fresh, okay. What was it? Plop, plop. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Okay, okay. The high school kids have no idea what you're talking about. But that's okay. They'll get theirs too. <laughs> Other ones. Got milk. Got milk. Um, zoom, zoom, zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Oh, Volkswagen, yeah. right? Mazda. Just, oh. just do it. J Nike, just do it. Good. Best care in the air. Air train. I mean, Midwest. Like a good neighbor. Like a good neighbor. Reminds me of the, the um, what's the other one? Um, the good hands people you're in good hands with all state. Okay. Yeah, mutual of Omaha. Can you hear me now? Oh. Oh. Oh, that's good. Um, what was the one about when, was it E.F. Hutton? When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen, okay? All right. You all have been brainwashed beautifully. <laughs> and we're going to go back to that, okay? But now, in the meantime, let's talk about the Beatitudes. And it's, it really is all related, okay? As crazy as this all seems, it really is um, related. One of the best um, preachers that I ever had the chance to experience was Father Tom Siriano. Some of you may know him. And um, he, he used to do these homilies where he'd do these little pieces, and they were not related. I, I mean, they just were not related. But he'd tell us they were related, and, I, and as he was doing it, I kept thinking, okay, this is the Sunday where the wheels start to come off. <laughs> They're really not, it's really not related. And um, actually, he, he described it as a mosaic, and he'd turn his back and he'd go, okay, now we just put in another little piece in the mosaic, and now we're going to put another little piece. And he'd do something, and he'd put another little piece in there. And it never seemed like it was coming together, and then at the end it came together. So, God, I hope it all comes together. <laughs> um, all right, so the Beatitudes in Luke. Um, they're different than the Beatitudes in Matthew. And if I asked you what the Beatitudes are now, I would bet at least 9 out of 10 of you, whatever you could remember of the Beatitudes, you would be telling me Matthew's version of the Beatitudes. So... There's obviously way more written about Matthew's Beatitudes than Luke's Beatitudes. And I think there's a really good reason for that. Nobody, especially not first world Christians, wants to deal with Luke's Beatitudes because they're pretty much in our face. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to go there. We'd much rather talk about, from Matthew, how blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Because we can be poor in spirit, but I'm not thinking too many of us in this room are poor. And Luke is just right there with Jesus saying, how blessed are you, poor, for yours is the kingdom. And then, three or four verses later, he says, and this is really what we don't want to deal with, woe to you rich, for you've already got what you're going to get. First world Christians don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. So when I said yes to doing this, I didn't know what the topic was. That's my naivete, and I trust Sue. I, I should get over that. But um, I, So I, I, I said, oh, sure, I'll be glad to do it. What's it about? Oh, the Beatitudes. I'm thinking poor in spirit. Everybody can talk about poor in spirit. There's lots written about it. 
and then she said, well, but it'll be based on the Sunday reading. And then my calculator and my brain went, cycle C, Luke's gospel, uh-oh. <laughs> now we got trouble. So um, we got trouble because most of us aren't poor and um, most of us are rich, at least by the world's standards. If, if we were in groups of three people, so each one of us in a group of two other people from around the world, we would be the rich ones. I mean, easily we would be the rich ones. Um, and Jesus says in Luke's Gospel, woe to you rich. So, here's what, um, here's what I don't like about the Gospels. The Gospels are comfort for the afflicted, Comfort for the afflicted, that's okay. We can all do that, right? If I'm afflicted, if I've got problems, then I like to hear the comfort that the Gospels provide. However, not only are they comfort for the afflicted, but they're also affliction for the comfortable. So if you're comfortable, then this word is supposed to get under your skin. And it does, and it did for me. And I think that's part of what was happening for me is I don't want to say anything to you about this word because I, there's a very good chance that I could be a hypocrite by saying to you something about this scripture text and not letting it work in my life. And it has to work in my life. Um, St. Paul talks about being doers of the word. Don't just listen to the word, but be doers of the word. Do something because of this text. And I, this is a hard text. This is an awful text when it comes to that. So, um, you know, let, let's just do 25 words or less about Luke's Gospel so that we can sort of get a picture of how it's different than Matthew's. Um, Luke was written around the year 90, all right? Luke is not even Jewish. Luke is a Gentile. So, who, who was Jesus the Messiah for? I mean, who claimed him first? The Jews. Okay, so now already you've got someone telling a story about a Jewish Messiah who's expanding that. So Luke's Gospel is really about inclusion. Everybody gets included in Luke's Gospel. All the ones who are ostracized in the society are brought in. Jews would have said, Jesus is for us and for our salvation, and too bad for everybody else. Now, Paul broke some of that apart, but there were lots of fights in the early Christian community about that. But now Luke comes along and is going to tell the story of Jesus, but not necessarily from a Jewish perspective. So that's critical because Luke's, today's gospel starts out with Jesus was on a mountain, came down from the mountain, now is on a level place, and then he does the Sermon on the Mount. Well, he doesn't really do the Sermon on the Mount because the Sermon on the Mount is from Matthew. Because Matthew is trying to tell people in his gospel about how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of what the Jews have been longing for and expecting. So who's the greatest teacher in Jewish history? Who gave us the Ten Commandments? Moses. Okay, where did Moses get those Ten Commandments? On the mountain? So where must Jesus have gone to get the Beatitudes? The mountain, because he's the new Moses. And Matthew goes to great lengths to talk about how Jesus is the new Moses. And in fact, he has, it's very artistically done, he has the book divided into um, what some people would call a decalogue. A, a, there, there are ten divisions in Matthew because there are ten commandments. And Jesus is the new Moses, so he would do it. And all of his audience, all of his Jewish audience would have known that Jesus was standing in the line of Moses. Luke, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily care about that, has other concerns about that. And in the Greek world, there was as, as advanced as the Greek world was in, in terms of, well, it seems stupid to say this now, but in, in terms of technology, it, clearly they weren't advanced 
like we are advanced, but for their time they were advanced in terms of technology and had really developed a political system and a social system that was more advanced. What they had not done, however, was taken care of the poor. There was no provision in Greek culture for someone who was poor, which is curious because that was the vast majority of people who were poor. So those poor had to fend for themselves. There was no provision for that. At least in Judaism, there was some, the prophets had taught some things about taking care of the poor and the widows and the orphans, that there was an obligation that the Jews had to sort of have pity on them and, and try and make their lot better. Um, so Luke really goes at that and challenges the cultural expectation that there's not really anything you do for the poor. They're just stuck. They're just poor. Leave them alone, don't worry about it. Luke says, how blessed are the poor, the ones that you think don't belong. They belong, and in fact, not only do they belong, but theirs is the kingdom. They get everything. And woe to you rich, because you got all you got. This is it, this is all you get. Um, let's look at, um, I put Bibles on the table, or a Bible on the table. Let's look at um, Luke's Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6. Okay. And if, if somebody at your table could read it, I think the passage that we're looking at starts at verse 20 and goes until verse 27. It probably is set off in your text. So could somebody read that at your table? Okay, now let's go to Matthew, two books before that, to chapter 5 in Matthew. And that text starts at verse 3. So if someone would read that. And now, what I want you to do is, you've just heard Luke's version of the Beatitudes. Now listen to Matthew's version of the Beatitudes. And this is the version that's more common, that, that you probably know more, or when you think of Beatitudes, this is what you think of. But go ahead and read those Beatitudes. And again, probably in terms of the text, they're set off, so you'll know where they end. Okay, differences. What differences do you notice? Not a single woe. Matthew is the feel-good guy. He's, he's not really, because he has a judgment scene that makes me really terribly uncomfortable. But in, at least in terms of this beatitude, the, the beatitude section, he's much more positive. What else do you notice? Luke seems to be more about um, the Okay, so Luke is about what you have, just sort of what is, and Matthew is much more about an attitude or um, a, a virtue. He's talking about virtues, that we can, we can take on those things. We can become poor in spirit if we're not. We can, um, we can hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. Um, we, we can do those things. In Luke, either you're poor or you're rich, and that just is. And this is what happens as a result of that is. Okay. Anything else? Uh, and Luke, it seems that it really hits you with your own personal responsibility. Okay. And what is that responsibility? Well, that uh, you have to look towards, you have to look for whatever riches and talents you have and go out. <laughs> Okay, all right, and Matthew's easier to follow that way. Luke is just, it is, and now you got to figure this out. He doesn't give us a clue about it except, woe to you rich. So, now, that doesn't mean that we can just dismiss Luke or, or just sort of be slapped and not do anything with it. Um, because I think what... What both Luke and Matthew, the, the reason we looked at those two texts is that each gospel writer has a particular view of Jesus. 
you know about eyewitness phenomenon, right? People see, five people see an accident, you get six different stories. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're not telling the truth, it means that they're remembering it from their perspective. It's their interpretation. There really is, I, when I was in school a hundred years ago, they used to teach that there was this thing called objective truth. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, because I think we all remember things the way we remember things. And so the people we call historians really have a particular bent or a bias or a, um, well, bias is probably the best word to describe it. So that there isn't any such thing as sort of objective, uh, an objective news story. There's always some bias built into it, conscious or, or unconscious. So um, each of the gospel writers has a particular view of Jesus and we, if, if we don't read the text for, for what the text says, we miss a beautiful piece. You know how we do this? Well, we do this with the Beatitudes. This is a classic text. So we miss it that Luke has the woes and we just really pretty much focus on Matthew's be poor in spirit. That's a whole lot easier. That's the plop, plop, fizz, fizz version of the... Um, I didn't really say that. Oh my God. Okay, that was one of those crazy things that I just say. Um, all right, so in Luke's gospel, and I didn't check this out, but you can check this out if you want. One scripture scholar says one out of every seven verses in Luke is about wealth. One out of every seven verses is about wealth. Uh, chances are good those of us in this room have a problem then <laughs> because most of us if we look economically are in that in that category so then what do we do I mean because if, if we if the other thing that we have to know about Luke is that Luke is Luke's vision of God and of Jesus is that they're all forgiving and that that God is graciously merciful okay I take great comfort in the fact that if I am one of the rich and Jesus says to me, woe to you rich, this is all you're going to get, then I also can go back to Luke saying, nothing is impossible with God. So maybe there's, maybe there's a possibility here, even though, according to Jesus in Luke, I'm being judged. Luke was a physician. Luke was the one who came back on the He was, he, yes. Right, and, and noticing what really was affecting people and their relationship with God. So that he's not glorifying being poor, you know, that it's something to strive for, because the, the lot of the poor is miserable. It, it, it is. But he's also saying this probably, if, if one out of seven verses in Luke is about wealth, then clearly there's something about wealth, like you said, that gets in the way of people being faithful to the message of Jesus or being a part of what God would have us be a part of, which is um, the kingdom, God's kingdom. Or uh, someone recently referred to it as, although it sounds like I have a kind of a speech problem when I say this, the kingdom of God, that it's about kinship relationships, that, that it's about right relationships. Whatever God's kingdom is, I, I think we have to, in Catholic theology over the years, we did this wonderful thing about, about heaven and hell and then there was purgatory and limbo and all of that stuff. Jesus had a notion of God's kingdom and that we were all moving toward the kingdom, that God was going to cause that kingdom or kingdom where we have right relationships with people, that God was going to bring that about and that we were either going to be a part of that because of how we lived our life, or we weren't going to be a part of that. In some ways, it was either you're for us, like St. Paul says, or you're against us. So the kingdom of God is about right relationships. So relationships between me and my neighbors, between me and those who aren't my neighbors but who are other people, so that I have the right relationship with everyone. So, and clearly you can say if it's about, if wealth gets in the way of my relationship with God, it also gets in the way of my relationship with everyone else. So then I have a social obligation to be on a kinship level with people. Um, and in, in 
Luke, there's an invitation to see things the way God sees things, not to see things the way people see things. Now, here's the other thing, and Father Art alluded to it last week. Um, he was talking about how tame we make God's word. You know, that we come to church, and this really, this, this struck me. We sit in the same places in church, don't we? Now, you know why we do that? I'm a psychologist. I know why we do that. Because we all like routine. We all like to be comfortable. We all like the security of all of that. We don't like to be experiencing new things. The problem is that it, it occurred to me, because of what Father Art said, that what we're missing when we do that is that we just want God to be nice to us. We just want to have that comfort for our afflictions. But we are comfort, we are oh so comfortable. And really, so here's my challenge, one of my challenges is to sit someplace different next week. And it'll be disconcerting and there'll probably even be a little, of ang little anxiety going on. And you won't recognize everybody around you. But you know what? You may be more open to seeing things the way God sees things instead of being safe and secure in the way that you see things. Uh, it's not comfortable. And I'm not really trying to put therapists into business because you'll be so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I'm really not. But sit somewhere else so that you get a little bit disturbed by what happens. The author, Annie Dillard, I don't know if any of you know her, she has a wonderful piece about liturgy where she says, when we come to worship, most of us just want to feel good. And really, why aren't we wearing our hard hats? Because God is about constructing the kingdom, and we just come like, oh, another Sunday, another chance to sing some nice songs, see some people, have a donut. Oh, isn't that just wonderful? That's not what God is about. God is about building God's kingdom. Jesus is about commanding us, inviting us into God's kingdom. So um, how does God see things or how does Jesus see things? These are um, all from Luke, actually. Now listen to this, because this is not how I'm going to make a distinction between our ego, you know, how we make decisions, how the world infiltrates us, you know, the, the advertising being brainwashed thing. We all have those slogans floating around in our heads, and advertisers are incredibly good at that. Um, that is not how God sees the world. God is not the big advertiser in the sky, okay? But this is what Jesus says in Luke's Gospel. And listen to how it reverses what we normally think. The first shall be last. Now, who doesn't want to be first? Everybody wants to be first. You want to be first in your class. You want to be first in the league. You want to be first in your office. You want to be in your sales force. You want to be the first one. The first are going to be last. And the last are going to be first. That totally reverses our world. It totally reverses things. Those who humble themselves shall be exalted. Well, who wants to walk around being humble? I mean, that's not what... I mean, we're about building ourselves up and making ourselves look better and, and you know, really sort of putting ourselves out there. Well, if we humble ourselves, we'll be exalted. If we exalt ourselves, we'll be hum humbled. It reverses our world. The kingdom, we just talked about this, the kingdom belongs to the poor, not to the rich. The oppressed, the beaten down, the defeated, those are the ones who win in the end. Those are the ones that are set free. And then you know all about the physical ones, so the blind see, the lame walk, the sick are healed, the deaf hear. All people are made whole, complete, filled up. So God has a special place for those who are less than, who don't have everything that most people have going for them. And then who gets into the kingdom? Tax collectors. Now, here's the thing. We hear tax collectors, we think IRS, and some of us kind of moan a little bit like, oh, those tax collectors. In Jesus' time, tax collectors were, were dirtier than dirt. I mean, they extorted people. So it wasn't like there were rules that you had to follow, and then if you didn't follow the rules, then you got in trouble. It was when the tax collector came to your house, he was going to get every cent out of you that he possibly could. And he was going to do whatever he could to get that money, because he got a big cut out of it. 
Okay? So they were really extortionists. They weren't really tax collectors. Jesus says, tax collectors are entering, entering the kingdom of God before you. Okay, now wait a second. Something's wrong there. That's not how I want to think about this. Tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, shepherds. You know what shepherds? If you've ever been around sheep for a long time, they stink. And if you're out in the field with those sheep, you stink just like the sheep do. And so shepherds were outcast too. So when they would come into town, people would hightail it because that shepherd stunk. And so here's Jesus saying, the stinky people among you are coming into the kingdom before you. Before you who are so proper and have wonderful smells and scents and all of that. The stinky people. Luke goes to great efforts to tell us about how women are coming into the kingdom. And we don't have anywhere near the sexism and patriarchy that they would have had then. I mean, women, women would not have even been listened to or really considered when important decisions came about. Now, women, you also know that you always had the power, but um, children are entering the kingdom. Samaritans, who aren't even good Jews. I mean, wh Samaritans. Okay, now, who, who in your world has no chance of getting into the kingdom? I mean, think about that for a second. Who, when you view the world, has no chance of getting into the kingdom? They've got a better chance than you do. Because you think you're going into the kingdom. You see how he reverses it all? He turns it upside down? Um, so, so what do we do with all of that? Well, let's look at how things are in our world. Let me throw some statistics at you. Not because I like statistics, because anybody who did graduate school knows statistics are a bane of a student's existence. These are old statistics, but listen to this. In 1983, only $100 million in TV advertising was aimed at children. Only $100 million. By 1997, that figure climbed to $1 billion with the total amount of ads and marketing in all media reaching $12.7 billion. That's 10 years ago, $12.7 billion. Do advertisers want to get into your head and tell you how to think about things and tell you what to value? And they're incredibly skilled. Um, I just read something last week that the American Psychological Association, um, there's a resolution in front of the, the APA that, um, challenges psychologists not to participate in advertising, not to participate in conducting research to find out what really trips people's triggers because it ends up being used against them and manipulates them. Um, two-thirds of parents in a study commissioned by the Center for a New American Dream, two-thirds of parents say their, their own children define their self-worth in terms of possessions. Two-thirds, 66% of parents say that their kids define themselves by the possessions they have, the jeans they wear, the tennis shoes they wear, um, the logos that they have. And we're just as, I mean, I'm not blaming them. I mean, we're just as guilty of all of this as, as anybody. Um, for, listen to this. This is from an economist. 40% of adults earning between fifty and hundred thousand dollars a year, so earning between fifty and hundred thousand dollars a year, claim they can't afford all that they need. Forty percent who have all of that wealth can't get all of they all of what they need, or what they define as what they need. It gets worse. Twenty-seven percent of adults earning over a hundred thousand dollars claim they can't afford all they need. Now, I was going to do the math this morning, but it seemed like it was way too complicated while I was driving. $5.15 an hour times 40 is $200 a week, times 52 is $10,000 a year, maybe $12,000 a year. That's minimum wage. Lots of people are working for minimum wage. So if 40% of adults earning fifty dollars to $100,000 can't afford all that they need, what chance does someone not making that have? And then how does wealth get in the way of, if we spend all of our time thinking that we need all of these things, how much time are we spending on seeing things the way God would see things? 
No wonder our wealth gets in the way. Here's a, um, a, a story. Um, remember Archbishop Weakland? Hasn't been all that long. Um, he, when he first came to Milwaukee as Archbishop, he would go to on parish visits and would meet oftentimes with groups of confirmation kids. And they would ask him questions like, he'd always open it up for questions, and he'd always ask him questions like, well, what's it like to be called by God? And, you know, how many hours a day do you pray? And, you know, the kinds of things that you'd expect. He said by the time he, just before retirement, he realized that, that those questions weren't coming anymore. You know what the most often asked question was? How much do you make? How much do you make? Of the archbishop. Imagine what they'd ask of a CEO. I mean, where, where is the spiritual value? So how does our wealth get in the way of seeing things the way God sees it? Um, the prophet Muhammad says, riches are not from abundance of worldly goods. Riches are not from abundance of worldly goods, but from a contented mind. So what about all of this? What do we do with all of this? Well, I think, I mean, I, I have a couple of suggestions. Actually, I have more than a couple of suggestions. One is that, um, we already talked about it, that you sit someplace different in church and expect to be disturbed. Expect to see things the way God sees things, not the way you see things. Now, you know what? We're Americans, and we are all entitled to our opinion, aren't we? But when does God's word take over in us as opposed to us having our opinion about it? And, and, I, and I'm skilled at this. I know how to make things feel comfortable to me. Woe to the rich. You know what? Those are those people who must be making over $100,000 a year because it's not me. I'm not rich. I'm not rich. I'm the poor. So that's how Jesus is talking to me. Yeah, well, that doesn't work. That's not true. That's not what the text says. Um, so sit someplace different. How about paying attention to interruptions in your life? If you want to make God laugh, tell God your plans. Because you're all living the life that you expected when you were 17 or 18. I certainly am living the life exactly the way I thought. I mean, not even close. What was I thinking? So pay attention to how things get interrupted because our normal reaction to interruptions is to get angry about it, right? Ugh, it's not going the way I want it to. Ugh, I had a plan. Well, maybe that's God breaking into your life to stir things up. Maybe, not always. Sometimes inter some interruptions are just, Freud would say, some interruptions are just interruptions. But it's true sometimes that God is trying to break in and disturb things in our life if we're open to seeing it that way. If all we're going to do is focus on our anger, we're going to miss entertaining angels unawares. How about this? How about reading scripture? Now, I've been at this a long time, and I know how difficult it is to read the scriptures. Nobody wants to pick up the scriptures because you read a little bit. It doesn't take long. If you get 20 verses before you find out something that doesn't make any sense to you, or, or you're totally lost, or what does that mean? It's really easy to give it up. I totally get that. So here's my suggestion. That you get a good Bible that has lots of notes in it, lots of footnotes. Now, we all are Americans. We want instantaneous gratification. We want to know exactly what Jesus says in words that we can understand right here, right now. Don't make me think about it. Sorry. It can't happen that way. First of all, the people who wrote the scriptures were pre-scientific people. So everything you know about cause and effect and science and planets, and all, they didn't have any idea about any of that. Not, they didn't know anything about that. So their worldview and the way they saw things was completely different. So we have to spend some time and some work trying to understand that. So get a Bible with good notes and read those introductions, read those notes, and maybe even read a commentary about the scriptures. It's not going to come easy, no matter how hard you want it to. And I'm an American just like you. I want it to be easy. But it's a lot of work. Um, let me give you the names of three authors that write books about, that have some books about Jesus that have um, stirred people into thinking differently. Um, the first is a book that, that I read and... Um, 
at 2.30 in the morning, he upended my world, and I read until 6.30 because I, he was saying something so different to me, and I'd never thought about it, and all I could think of while I was reading this was, why did I read this so late at night? Because he's ruining my next day, and he, I've been disturbed ever since. His name is Albert Nolan, N-O-L-A-N, Albert Nolan. And the book um, that I was referring to is um, Jesus Today. It's called Jesus Today. It's a relatively easy read. It's subtitled The Spirituality of Radical Freedom. Um, but he says things in there that you probably have not heard about Jesus and really, really changed the way I thought about Jesus. So that would be one. He also has a book called um, Jesus Before Christianity, again, getting in the mind of Jesus. Second author, Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R. He has a number of books, lots of books. Actually, someone said about Richard Rohr that every word he ever thought, he wrote down. <laughs> so, but he's, he's, he challenges me to think differently about it. He has a book about um, the good news according to Luke. He also has a book about Matthew's Beatitudes called Jesus' Plan for a New World. Another book called Simplicity. And anything that you can get your hands on by John Shea. Okay, he's a former priest from Chicago who's a storyteller par excellence. Um, he, will, he will reverse the way you think about things, get you to think about things in a new way. Um, all right, um, while they're coming in, any questions about any of that? How many are going to sit in different places next Sunday? Way to humor me. I like it. All right. Let me, let me, as long as they're coming in, let me tell a story. All right. Poor Jewish rabbi and his wife and daughters, and they lived in Krakow on the street of the Lost Angel. I know absolutely nothing about Polish geography, okay? So if you know something different, don't let that distract you. Luke didn't know anything about the Holy Land. In fact, Luke probably hadn't even been to the Holy Land. He gets geography wrong, too. I figure I'm in really, really good company. Okay. Poor Jewish rabbi, his wife and daughters, they live in Krakow on the street of the lost angel. And because the rabbi is a poor and simple man, every night he dreams about finding a lost treasure and being rich. Every night. And every morning he wakes up and he tells his wife, you're not even going to believe this. And she says after a while, Oh, let me guess, you had a dream about finding a lost treasure. Now, get out of bed, go get some work for the day, some day labor, so you can bring home some money, so we can buy some food and feed our family. This goes on for years. Finally, one morning, he wakes up and he says, Honey, you're not even going to believe the dream I had. And she said, impatiently, as wives can be given to do, I bet you dreamed about finding a lost treasure. And he said, Well, yeah, but this was different. I saw it. I mean, I saw that bridge leading into Warsaw, and underneath that bridge is a lost treasure. And she said, okay, now I know you're crazy because we don't, we've never been to Warsaw. We don't know if there's a bridge leading into Warsaw, but you know what? I'm sick of this. I want you to go. Go to Warsaw. Find out that there's no bridge. There's no lost treasure. Get this out of your mind. This is crazy. I'm tired of this. She helped him pack. He goes the several days journey to Warsaw. As he approaches Warsaw, sure enough, there's the bridge. Just like he saw it in his dream. He had never been there before. He saw it in his dream so clear, and he knew that underneath that bridge was a lost treasure. All he had to do was unearth that treasure and be rich. Except for one thing. There was a guard guarding the bridge. And so because he had traveled that several days journey, he was tired, didn't know quite what to do with the guard, so he laid down in the bushes and fell asleep. Upon waking, he rustled in the bushes. The guard saw him, came over, pointed his rifle at him, and said, You, there in the bushes, come forward. And because the rabbi was a poor and simple man, he couldn't run. And the guard said, What are you doing here? And because the rabbi was a poor and simple man, he couldn't lie. And so he said, Several days ago, I had a dream that underneath this bridge, there's a lost treasure, and I'm here to unearth that treasure and be rich. And the guard looked at him and said, Well, that's very odd because several nights ago I too had a dream and right after I'm done with this shift I leave for Krakow for the home of a poor Jewish rabbi and his wife and daughters and in the bricks of their fireplace is the lost treasure if you look for God 
in your material possessions or in your wealth, you're going to miss how God is already present in the bricks of your own fireplace. So that's a story. Thank you.